An armed insurrectionist, teamster with perhaps ties to the mafia, socialite turned terrorist, presidential sibling, and even a former president of the United States have all received either a presidential pardon or commutation of their sentence. A tradition far older than any modern republic with various emperors and monarchs having similar powers. Seemingly as long as there have been emperors and monarchs, the power of the United States president to grant clemency traces its more direct lineage to a time when the Anglo-Saxons ruled England. Originally residing with the king, the first written record of such pardoning power among these Anglo-Saxon rulers is found in section 6 of the king's statutes during the rule of King Ein from 668 to 725 AD, where it identified that the king had the power to either kill or not anyone who got into a fight in his castle. By the time of the Norman Conquest, 1066 AD, the king's pardoning power, codified in the Codes of William the Conqueror, 1066 to 1087 AD, had expanded to include thievery as well as sedition. William's son, Henry I, from 1100 to 1135 AD, broadens the power even further in Legas Henry C. Primi to include breach of the peace, killing of servants, contempt of writs, and outlawry. This power continued to expand and remained with the monarch or executive in England even through the establishment of the British colonies in America and then the Revolution. And as the founders turned to British law in crafting the Constitution, they included the power to pardon in Article 2, Section 2, to wit, the President shall have the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. As with the rest of the Constitution, when it came time to interpreting its sparse language on the power to reprieve, the country turned to the judiciary and the Supreme Court. Early on, in United States and Wilson from 1833, Chief Justice Marshall held that the presidential pardoning power was nearly as broad as that of English monarchs, stating, "...the Constitution gives to the President the power to grant reprieves and pardons." As this power has been exercised from time immemorial by the executive of that nation whose language is our language, and to whose judicial institutions ours bear a close resemblance, we adopt their principles respecting the operation and effect of a pardon. And while many jurists have found this interpretation appropriate, others were disturbed by the idea of bestowing upon an American president the broad powers of an English king. As Justice McLean wrote in dissent in Ex Party Wells in 1855, he had doubts that it was safe for a Republican chief magistrate to be influenced by the power of the British sovereign. Likewise, Chief Justice Taney in Fleming and Page from 1850, while acknowledging the United States' heavy dependence on English jurisprudence generally, questioned the prudence of relying on it when determining the distribution of political power between the great departments of government. There is such a wide difference between the President and the English Crown. In any event, the power has always been and remains today a broad one, and constitutional scholars have identified at least three purposes for it. One, to temper justice with mercy. Two, to better execute public policy such as to obtain testimony of accomplices, and three, as Alexander Hamilton put it in the Federalist No. 74, to ensure peace in seasons of insurrection or rebellion. And accordingly, over the years, presidents have continuously used the pardon usually for one of these purposes. For example, both George Washington, 16 clemencies, and John Adams, 21 clemencies, pardoned people convicted of treason or other crimes during the Whiskey Rebellion. Thomas Jefferson, 119, pardoned a person convicted of sedition for his criticism of the federal government, and James Madison, 196, pardons the governor of Michigan Territory, who had been sentenced to death for surrendering Fort Detroit. Other notable clemencies include President Buchanan, 150, pardoning Brigham Young and other Mormons in 1858 for their role in the Utah War, which, among other things, included a massacre of 100 civilians on a wagon train to California. Likewise, the 20th century also saw a number of high-profile clemencies. In 1971, President Nixon, 926, commuted Jimmy Hoffa's sentence for jury tampering and mail fraud. Then, shortly after, in 1974, President Ford, 409, controversially turned around and pardoned former President Richard Nixon. Nixon, even though he had yet to be charged with a crime. President Ford also restored Confederate General Robert E. Lee's citizenship rights and offered conditional amnesty to over 50,000 men who had illegally avoided the Vietnam War draft. Patty Hearst, the kidnapped socialite turned Symbionese Liberation Army terrorist, had her sentence commuted by President Carter, 566, in 1979, and received a full pardon from President Clinton, 459, in 2001. As you can imagine, not everyone is pleased with every clemency 
and often the president's motives for granting a pardon or commuting a sentence are called into question. For example, when Nixon commuted Hoffa's sentence, many thought it was done in exchange for the union vote in 1972. Other infamous clemencies include two pardons granted by President Clinton to his friend Mark Rich for tax evasion and illegal trading, and his own brother Roger Clinton Jr. for cocaine possession. Similarly, President George W. Bush's commutation of the sentence of his vice president's aide, Scooter Libby, for perjury and lying to the FBI relating to the leak of the identity of a CIA operative was strongly condemned by members of the opposite political party. Regardless, clemency marches on, and by the end of his second term, President Obama, 1,927, had commuted the sentences of more than 1,700 individuals, the majority of which were in jail or prison for nonviolent drug crimes, often with sentences far harsher than someone would get for committing the same crime today thanks to the peak of the so-called war on drugs. Or in some cases, individuals who, by the law of the land in 2017, wouldn't have been considered to have committed a crime at all. And now for a bonus fact. Speaking of pardons, starting sometime around the late 18th century, they came up with a rather novel way for someone to get a pardon for a death sentence in a certain part of the Ottoman Empire. At the time, numerous executions, whether they involved commoners or the Sultan's own family, took place in the Topkapi Palace in modern-day Istanbul. Criminals to be executed on palace grounds were only made aware of their fate on the same day that they were meant to be executed via means of a sweetened drink made with sherbet. The accused would customarily be presented with this drink three days after appearing in court. The color of the drink would be indicative of the court's decision. As Professor Godfrey Godwin of Boazici University noted, if it were white, he sighed with relief, but if it were red, he was in despair because red was the color of death. Despite the vast number of executions that took place in the Sultan's palace, for reference, during the brief eight-year 16th century reign of Sultan Selim I alone, he is estimated to have had over 30,000 people executed there, there was no official executioner tasked with this seemingly never-ending job. Instead, the job of carrying out these executions usually fell to one of the palace's so-called gardeners, except when the person was of extremely high standing, in which case the execution would be carried out by the palace's Bastansi Basha, which roughly translates to head gardener. While you might think the name for these workers simply came from the fact that they were tasked with pruning off individuals who had been deemed unfit to be members of that society, they were also charged with literal gardening in maintaining the gardens and the grounds of the palace. Beyond this, they variously functioned as bodyguards, police, and security for the palace as the need arose, with several thousand gardeners on staff at any given time. Okay, so let's get to the race. While most who were given the red sherbet would simply be killed shortly after by a gardener, particularly high-ranking officials such as grand viziers still had a little bit of hope. The head gardener was on a bound to challenge these individuals to a foot race through the gardens to the place of execution near the fish market gate on the southern side of the palace, a distance of around 300 meters. If the person was able to finish the dash before the head gardener, their sentence would be reduced from death to simple banishment. As far as historians can tell from the known documented instances of this, very few people ever managed to defeat the Pastansi Basha in the race. This is perhaps not surprising, as the race was heavily stacked in the executioner's favor, considering he knew the palace grounds inside and out, and was more often than not in fantastic shape relative to the victim. All condemned who lost were immediately strangled upon reaching the gate. For those exceptional few who did manage to defeat the head gardener, sometimes things worked out even better than simply being banished. For instance, the last known condemned individual to win this deadly race was Grand Vizier Hatsi Sali Pasha in 1822. Partially due to the respect he gained for his reportedly impressive and unexpected victory, he was later pardoned and made Governor General in Damascus. It isn't clear how this racing tradition got started, though one can speculate it perhaps was inspired by condemned individuals, or maybe even a specific individual with nothing left to lose anyway, attempting such a flight out of the palace once they received the red sherbet. From there, maybe everyone just thought it was highly entertaining and something that should continue. Whatever the case, the race was first reported in the late 18th century, with evidence such as the case of Hatsi Sally Pasha suggesting it lasted at least two decades into the 19th century. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out my other channel called Highlight History? It's sort of a today in history thing. We also do very similar to this. If you like this, you'll probably like that. So please do check it out. There is a link below. And as always, thank you for watching.